This is Dr. William Burnett. I'm a child psychiatrist and a forensic psychiatrist. I'm a professor in Nashville, Tennessee at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. And this topic for, the, for today is parental alienation and Dalbert gatekeeping. So here's a little outline of what we want to do today. Uh, I'm going to go over the definition of parental alienation. And then these topics, is parental alienation generally accepted in the scientific community? Is it been subjected to peer review and publication? Has it been tested? And is there a scientific methodology? And then I'm going to explain some actual legal cases where parental alienation was presented. Um, let me let me say something though about these how these topics are organized. So I mentioned, uh, is it generally accepted? Has it been peer reviewed? Uh, has it been tested? So those topics are what constitute the Dalbert criteria. For I know that the attorneys know this, but the, uh, the parents and grandparents who are watching this uh, need a little explanation of the terminology. So when an expert goes to court, you, can, you can't just go in and talk about whatever you want. That there are certain criteria that have to be met. In other words, you have to be able to show that what you're talking about is scientific. And there's a set of five or six criteria uh, that have to be met. And yet you don't actually have to meet all of them. Uh, and uh, I don't think parental alienation probably doesn't meet all of them, but it does meet easily the three that I'm going to be explaining today. And I already mentioned the first one. Uh, is it generally accepted in the scientific community? But before we even get to that, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And in particular, um, I want to make sure that we're all using the same definition. So I've given talks like this many, many times, and I always start by giving the definition that I use for parental alienation, which is here. So let's read this together. Parental alienation refers to a situation when a child, usually one whose parents are engaged in a high conflict, separation or divorce, allies himself strongly with one parent, the preferred parent, and rejects a relationship with the other parent, the alienated parent, without a good reason, without legitimate justification. So I guess the words there that really are important is that usually this happens in the context of a high conflict divorce, but it, it can happen even when the parents are together. It, it, if a person is determined to alienate the child from the other parent, you can do that even when everybody's together and they're living in the same household. And the second part of this definition that's really important is that it's without, the, the child rejects the parent without a good reason or without legitimate justification. So th those are the components of this definition. Now, some people like seeing these diagrams. And as you can see in this diagram, there's the preferred parent and the alienated parent, and they blame each other for whatever happens. If the child is having some kind of problem, the parents, of course, blame each other. Part of this is what we call parental alienation. And this little yellow squiggle is what we mean when we talk about parental alienation. In other words, it's, it's the thing that's happening in the child, in the mind of the child, and in between the child and the rejected parent. And over here, this big red arrow is what we call alienating behaviors. In other words, the alienating parent engages in alienating behaviors that cause the child to reject the other parent. Now, in fact, you know, people use different terminology at times. But this is what um, this is what we use. Uh, just most people kind of want to know uh, something about mild, moderate, and severe. And so, in the way we think about things, the the definition of severity of alienation is based on the behavior of the child. Now, there there's a whole other discussion of the severity of the alienating behaviors. But that's something else. We're going to get to that in a, in a little while. But right now, the severity of the parental alienation is based on the condition of the child. And it can be mild, moderate, or severe. If it's mild, it means that 
Um, the child complains about spending time with the other parent, but goes and has a good time. Moderate, the child complains about and is oppositional about going to see the other parent. And most of the time is oppositional uh, during, the, during the parenting time, but not totally. Usually in moderate cases, there might be times when, when the child loosens up and gets along and is cooperative. Not so with severe. In severe cases, the child adamantly refuses to have a relationship with the rejected parent and threatens to run away or threatens various horrible things and, and does not participate and either doesn't go at all or does not participate in anything um, when, when parenting time occurs. So those are some definitions. And so I told you that uh, there are several criteria that we're going to be thinking about for whether we pass the Dalbert test. And the first one is, is the concept of parental alienation, is it, is it accepted in the scientific community? In other words, is it, is it generally accepted in the community of psychologists and psychiatrists and social workers and people, people who work in this area? In other words, people who actually work in the area of, of uh, child, uh, children of divorce and, uh, child custody issues and so on. So I'm going to tell you about several organizations that have said um, at one time or another that they've said positive things about parental alienation, like, like they might publish some sort of document uh, that's an official document of that organization, and that, that document talks about parental alienation. And I, I have, I, I guess, eight or nine of these organizations that do that. But let me give you a little warning, though. These organizations do not want people to say that they have a policy that approves of parental alienation or that they endorse parental alienation. Organizations are very sensitive about people speaking on their behalf and saying that they have a policy. So I, I try not to say that they have a policy or that they endorse parental alienation. What I can say is that they publish papers in which parental alienation is, is featured, or even not simply a paper in a journal, but they actually publish official documents in which parental alienation is discussed. So I think that's, I think that's pretty convincing that these organizations um, are, are believers in this concept, or at least many of their members are believers. That, that's another thing I should mention. These organizations are big. There are thousands of people in the American Psychological Association. And so some of them like the idea of parental alienation and some of them don't. But organizations don't come right out and say that the organization itself endorses anything. So let's, um, let's go through some of these organizations and you'll see what I mean. So this is what the topic is. Has the scientific community accepted parental alienation? So here's an organization that I belong to. And way back in the 1990s, uh, we, our organization, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, published an official action, which means it was approved by the board of directors of the organization. And it was called practice parameters or, or practice guidelines for how to do a child custody evaluation. And that document has a section, and with the, the heading of the section is parental alienation. That says, there are times during a custody dispute when a child can become extremely hostile toward one of the parents. The child finds nothing positive in his or her relationship with the parent and prefers no contact. The evaluator must assess this apparent alienation and form a hypothesis of its origins. So that's a good example where uh, a very important psychiatry organization in the United States has an official document in which they talk about parental alienation and explain it. So here, let's do another one. So uh, many of you attorneys and judges are familiar with this organization, AFCC, or the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts. So um, several years ago, they published standards for how to conduct a child custody evaluation. And let's see what they say. They talk about how what areas of knowledge a person needs to have to conduct a custody evaluation. And one of the things they talk about is what they refer to 
as areas of additional specialized training. And they say that includes the assessment of children's resistance to spending time with a parent or parent figure and allegations of attempts to alienate children from a parent, parent figure or a significant other. So here's a document published by the uh, AFCC in which they talk about parental alienation and explain what it is. So I, 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 I take that to mean that uh, I'm not trying to say that they have an official policy about this or anything else, but it clearly the, the, there are members of the AFCC who wrote this document and endorse the reality of parental alienation. Here's another thing that happened a few years ago at an AFCC meeting. This was back in Denver in 2010, that the, uh, at the plenary session, the opening plenary session uh, at that meeting was a discussion and presentations of various aspects of parental alienation. And at the end of that plenary session, we took a survey of everybody who was in the room. There were hundreds of people in the room and 300 people filled out the survey. And one of the questions on the survey was, do you think that some children are manipulated by one parent to irrationally and unjustifiably reject the other parent? Now, we don't use the word parental alienation. We simply use, describe what happens in parental alienation. And 98% of the people who responded to the survey agree with that statement. So what does this mean? In other words, I'm just trying to show that the concept of parental alienation is generally accepted by people who practice in this field. And I think this is, this is a good way to try to show that. So here's something that has been published by the American Psychological Association. And they're, they're, they, they've published a series of what they call handbooks. Now, they're, they're whole, no, I don't know, eight or 10 of them, of these handbooks in psychology. And this one is called the Handbook of Forensic Psychology, which is a two volume set. And sure enough, one of the chapters in this big, big book is called Child Custody and Access. Uh, Mark Ackerman and Jonathan Gould are well-known psychologists in this area. And in this chapter, there is a section called Child Alienation. And they say over the past 25 years, considerable discussion has focused on the dynamics and processes of child alienation, several different models that, that, that they go into. So, you know, we're not trying to say that every single person in the American Psychological Association agrees with this. We're not trying to say that the APA has a formal policy, but we are saying that there are significant people in the American Psychological Association who endorse the concept and the reality of parental alienation. And that, and if, and if we have enough of these, I think it, it proves that parental alienation is generally accepted by the relevant scientific community. Generally accepted does not mean it has to be 100% accepted, but uh, you have, I think courts have to figure out exactly what that word means. But I think we have enough organizations to be able to show that. Here's another one. So here's an encyclopedia from several years ago, and they actually have a chapter, the Encyclopedia of Forensic Science, which is published by Wiley, which is a big company in the United Kingdom. Uh, they publish this huge encyclopedia and they have a chapter called Parental Alienation. And, and it starts out, this is the opening paragraph. In the context of divorce, the pathological alignment of a parent and a child resulting in the child's rejection of that parent, the alienated parent. And it was described by various people, Westman, Wallerstein and Kelly, Kopetsky, Clower and Rivlin, and so on. And then it goes on to discuss parental alienation. Here's another encyclopedia, which is the Encyclopedia of Clinical Psychology, which is also published by that big company called Wiley. And they also have a chapter on parental alienation, which says in the abstract, parental alienation is a mental condition in which a child, usually one whose parents are engaged in a high conflict separation or divorce, allies himself or herself strongly with one parent, the preferred parent, and rejects a relationship with the other parent, the alienated parent, without legitimate justification. So I just want to ask you, does that sound familiar? 
Well, that's the, that's the same definition that I gave you at the very beginning of this presentation. And that's my definition because I wrote this part of the encyclopedia. In other words, you know, they, they got in touch with me, they invited me to write a section on parental alienation, which is, is a pretty much of an honor, I suppose. And, um, and I use my definition and there it is. Uh, here's another book that's published by the American Bar Association, which once again, doesn't mean that the ABA has a policy about parental alienation, but this is a book that they published. This is a very famous book by Clower and Ritalin uh, called Children Held Hostage, in which they evaluated a thousand children and they described um, alienation. They actually call it programming and brainwashing, but it, it overlaps, their definitions overlaps, overlap with our definition of parental alienation. Here's another one. I think this is the last one, the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers. They also have some guidelines and they, it's similar to one of these other ones. They don't have the words parental alienation, but they describe it. They say a child may also resist parenting due to contrived or magnified concerns regarding a parent that may be supported by the non-rejected parent. So that, I mentioned the American Psychological, well, here's the American Psychiatric Association. And so lots of times people wanna know is parental alienation in the DSM-5? So uh, the actual words are not in the DSM-5, but the concept of parental alienation is in this book in three different places. These are three different diagnoses that are in the book. And the first one is a very long diagnosis, child affected by parental relationship distress. And if you look at the definition that's in the DSM, it paraphrases uh, what happens in parental alienation. In other words, it says the child experiences negative effects of what happens between the parents, the discord, and the discord consists of conflict, distress, or disparagement. In other words, the parents are saying bad things about each other. So that's a paraphrase of what sometimes happens or usually happens in parental alienation. There's another diagnosis called parent-child relational problem, and the, and the definition of that paraphrases what happens in parental alienation. And there's another one called child psychological abuse, which does the same thing. But all this means is that if a clinician has a case of parental alienation and you need to put down an official diagnosis, you can put down one of these. And it depends on what you're focusing on as to which one you might put. If you're focusing on the child's mental condition, in this bad situation, you would use CAPRD, that is child affected by parental relationship distress. If you're focusing on uh, the relationship between the child and the rejected parent, you might call it parent-child relational problem. If you're focusing on the behaviors of the alienating parent, the uh, harmful, what we call child abuse, you, you could use the diagnosis child psychological abuse. So I think it's possible to say that uh, parental alienation concept is in the DSM, even though the actual words are not. Here are a few more books, and there's another organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and these are important books for psychiatrists and psychologists. Uh, perhaps the most famous one is called the Comprehensive Textbook of Psychiatry, which is this encyclopedia for psychiatrists that's uh, re renewed about every 10 years, and parental alienation is discussed in that big, big book. So um, what I've been trying to do here is go over the first of these three, uh, these three criteria, these the three Daubert criteria. The first one was, is it generally accepted by the relevant scientific community? And, I've gone through a number of different organizations. And I think if you're in court and you're faced with this and, and you're challenged on it, it is fairly easy. You, you can actually dig up all these documents that I've been quoting from and print them out and, and so on and, and present them as evidence that this concept is generally accepted by the relevant scientific community. 
So what we want to do now is head, head on to the next of these Daubert criteria that we're talking about. And it is, uh, has there been uh, literature in peer-reviewed journals? Has there, has there been peer-reviewed publications regarding this topic? So this is one of the several criteria. They're called Daubert criteria. And the criteria is, has it been published in peer-reviewed journals? And the answer that I'm going to give you is yes. So here's a question for you. It's, I guess it's a rhetorical question since I'm not going to be able to hear your answer. Has there been much research regarding parental alienation? And so obviously the, the answer that I'm looking for is yes. There's been lots of research. And in, uh, when we were collecting these articles a few years ago, I, I was one of the things I was just amazed is we turned up articles. Now, I'm not talking about newspaper articles here or magazine articles. I'm talking about professional articles in journals, or in some cases, book chapters written by professionals from uh, 38 countries. There might, maybe there are more by now. But obviously, this is all over the world. This is from six different continents, and it's really impressive when you try to look this all together. So the answer is yes, there is lots of research and lots of, lots of literature on this topic. So uh, I like to make this distinction between qualitative research and quantitative research. Qualitative research is much more common. It simply means that somebody has written an article in which they described a case of parental alienation or several cases. And hundreds of people have done this in these different countries. Quantitative research is less common, but quantitative research involves statistics that you collect data, you analyze them statistically, and then you draw conclusions. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you should check out the Parental Alienation Database, which is on the uh, server of, of the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine Library. You, that's the, the URL down at the bottom, but you don't have to know that. You, you can just Google parental alienation database and this will come up. So it has hundreds of articles. Most of them are references to qualitative research and a lesser number have to do with quantitative research. But here, what I'm talking about here in terms of the dollar criterion, I'm saying, has it been published in peer reviewed journals? And so for the purpose of answering that question, I focus on qualitative research. So here's an interesting question. When was the first publication? You know, we, we, when you study this, you get interested in the history. So when was the first publication regarding alienation? So think about that. And if you're an attorney, think about the first legal publication. And if you're a clinician, think about the first um, publication in the clinical literature. So here's the answer. We tracked down a case from England from 1804 called Demandville, and it was one of these disputes between a husband and wife who had gotten divorced. Back in those days, divorce was not so common. <clears throat> and back in those days, the fathers almost always got uh, custody of the child. In fact, I think there was even some kind of rule or legal precedence of it to that effect that they that the judge had to give the fathers custody of the child. So that's a that's maybe that was the earliest case we could locate. There's an interesting thing in the clinical literature, which is not a journal article, but it's a book published in the United States in the 1943. The name of the book is Maternal Overprotection. The author of this, David Levy, was a uh, psychiatrist who was, I think he was a child analyst in New York, and he was part of a child's uh, welfare organization. So he and his, his staff uh, reviewed cases that had come to their attention, and they, uh, they took out of these cases things having to do with this idea of maternal overprotection. So he doesn't talk about parental alienation. I mean, that, that word wasn't invented by that time. But he describes it. He describes it how some mothers are very possessive and controlling and take control of their children, even from an early age or even from birth. 
and the father is excluded. And he even, he even describes kind of the typical personality traits of the alienating mother and the alienating father that are still true today. So it's a fascinating book that pre uh, sort of was a harbinger of uh, later literature regarding parental alienation. So the other thing I like to talk about is how the actual, the current concept of parental alienation came about in the 1980s. And it wasn't simply Richard Gardner. He's the person who coined the phrase parental alienation syndrome. But there were actually six different researchers or groups of researchers who came up with this almost at the same time and almost independently. I think maybe to some extent they knew a little bit about each other. But uh, there's this uh, material publication uh, article, journal article by Wallerstein and Joan Kelly back in the 1970s where they described pathological alignment, which is the same as what we call parental alienation. Richard Gardner described PAS in 1985. Leona Kapetsky was a social worker in Colorado who did custody evaluations of the poor, and she described the same thing. I've already mentioned this book by Howard and Rivlin, who talk about brainwashing and indoctrination. And in their book, they talk about their work, which all, all their work happened in the 70s and 80s, even though the book was written later. This uh, social um, sociologist, Janet Johnston, and her colleagues described this in the Child Psychiatry Journal in 1985, a strong alliance is what they called it. And they related it. In other words, <clears throat> a couple of years later, they wrote another article in which they agreed that what they were calling strong alignments was what Gardner called PAS. So as time went on, these various people connected with each other and they all realized that they were talking about the same thing. Finally, there's a psychologist in Philadelphia named Barry Brooklyn and he, he coined this phrase in BOAI, not based on actual interventions. So that's kind of interesting. And I, I, I bring this up sometimes when I testify because I'm, I'm trying to get the point across because people degrade or, or criticize this concept and they blame it on Gardner. And they, or they, they say, oh, it was this guy named Richard Gardner who invented this. And it, it wasn't just him, that there were at least six more or less independent teams that were describing the same thing back in the 1980s. And I think that that also gives credibility to the concept that if you can show that the same discovery was made by different groups of researchers, I mean, that's important. It helps to prove the reality of, of, uh, of what they were talking about. So some people criticized Gardner. <clears throat> Uh, this was what he said in his very first publication in 1985. So here, this is worth reading. The primary manifestations of PAS is the child's campaign of denigration against the parent, a campaign that has no justification. The disorder results from the combination of indoctrination by the alienating parent and the child's own contributions to the vilification of the alienated parent. That was a very important observation that he made, that it's not simply the child is being brainwashed, but the child himself starts creating his own false set of facts. And uh, that PAS consists of, of the behavior by the parent, but also the mental process of the child. And as far as I know, Gardner was the first person to really notice that and, and he wrote about it in 1985. Now, sometimes Gardner is criticized because they wrongly say he had no empirical evidence, but he did. He had dozens. I think he had close to 100 cases in which he identified this phenomenon that he called parental alienation syndrome. And that's, that's a form of research. That, that's qualitative research where you collect cases, you describe them, you publish your findings, and that's what doctors have done for hundreds of years. You know, George Huntington was the person who uh, described Huntington's disease or Huntington's chorea in 1872. And that's what he did. He collected cases. On, he happened to be a family physician and his father had been on Long Island and they saved their 
They saved their case files. I mean, this is in the 19th century. And George Huntington pulled together, I guess there must have been a, a familial collection of cases because Huntington's Korea is inherited. So he probably found one or two families and that's how he was able to, to connect up several cases at once. And Leo Connor did, did something similar. He basically discovered autism in the 1940s. My point is that what Gardner did is exactly what hundreds of doctors have done is they collect cases, they describe them, they publish them. And that's a form of qualitative research. So it's really uh, an ignorant thing to say that Gardner had no empirical evidence. <coughs> so here's another person who did uh, qualitative research. And of course, Richard Warshak is pretty famous in this field. And his book is called The Boar's Poison. What's special about his book, as, as I think it's the most widely read book in the world regarding this topic, and it's been published in several different countries. And it's all qualitative, meaning that he describes parental alienation and he died, describes these little vignettes, <coughs> but he doesn't have any statistics. In other words, the, the most widely read book on this world, on this topic, is basically qualitative research. So, um, and he's also, of course, is published in peer reviewed journals, which is what I'm trying to show in this particular section, that there have been articles about parental alienation in peer reviewed journals. So, um, that's the, um, that's the, the second of these three things. The first one was, um, is it generally accepted by the scientific community? The second one is, has it been published in peer-reviewed journals? And for that, I'd like to take qualitative research uh, because I can show, you know, if I needed to, uh, dozens of articles from dozens of countries where it's been described. Now, the third criterion uh, related to the Daubert criteria is whether or not the concept of parental alienation has been scientifically tested through some kind of scientific methodology. So the answer to that is yes. And uh, let me give you some examples. Has it been tested with scientific methodology? So, uh, Way back when I gave you the definition and I showed you the yellow squiggle. So th those are the symptoms, the behavioral symptoms of parental alienation that the child manifests. So that's been studied. I mean, they were originally, these eight symptoms were originally described by Gardner back in 1985. But the question is, have, has, have they been scientifically, statistically studied? <clears throat> so Amy Baker has done a lot of research in this area and her colleague, Doug Darnell, um, interviewed a number of parents who uh, were alienated parents, and they uh, studied whether or not these eight symptoms occurred. In other words, did, did these parents describe their children manifesting these traditional eight symptoms of parental alienation? And the answer is yes, they did. <clears throat> and they statistically uh, explained uh, how often they occurred in their sample. So these are the eight symptoms that uh, people are generally familiar with, campaign of denigration, frivolous reasons for the denigration, lack of ambivalence, and so on. And then these are the, the numbers that um, they found in the sample of parents that they studied. The one thing that, to me that seems a little bit <clears throat> lower than I would have expected is down here, uh, one of the symptoms is that the child uses borrowed phrases. They're sometimes called borrowed scenarios. And it says that 79% of those children did that. I would have thought that would have been higher. In other words, it seems like to me that it's really common for a parent, an alienated parent, to have, to have a certain complaint about the other parent. And then the child comes in <clears throat> and says the same thing. But, so, but anyway, this is a good example of quantitative research uh, regarding parental alienation. 
And this is what they concluded, that these findings support Gardner's observations regarding the constellation of the eight common behavioral symptoms of PAS. So the other half of, the, of what happens are the alienating behaviors. So Baker and Darnell also studied that. And they interviewed uh, a series of parents and they asked them to tell us all the things, all the strategies that the other parent did uh, to cause the children to be indoctrinated. And they had hundreds and hundreds of things that they did and they, they grouped them and they classified them into 20 common behaviors and those were eventually reduced to 17. And, and these are called the 17 common alienating behaviors. So this was a statistical research. And so it's a good example of, of um, quantitative research. <clears throat> so this is an interesting study because this is the next step. In other words, if you're able to identify the eight common symptoms that occur in the children, and you're able to identify alienating behaviors in the parent, can you show that the alienating parent behaviors by the preferred parent are causing the children to have the symptoms of alienation? In other words, is a connection. Is there a connection between alienating behaviors and the behavioral symptoms in the children? That's a really important question. And this lady named Janelle Burrill did this years ago as part of her PhD. This was her thesis in getting her PhD, which was a beautiful study in which she, she was involved with uh, parents, uh, families who were having custody evaluations or disputes anyway in the court, which I think was in San Francisco. <clears throat> And so here you can see how she classified the 59 children into mild, moderate, and severe. And these, are, these definitions of mild, moderate, and severe are very similar to the definitions that I gave you a little while ago when we were talking when I first introduced the definition of parental alienation. And then I said, you know, you can talk about mild, moderate, and severe levels of, of the symptoms of alienation in the child. So that's what she did. She divided them up. <clears throat> Well, she also divided the alienating parents into mild, moderate, and severe. And so this is how adamant were the parents in trying to uh, brainwash the children against the other parent. And mild was called slight programming, but still thinks the other parent should be involved in some way. Moderate was feeling rejected, withholds the child, repeated negative comments, Severe is the, the alienating parent is obsessed with uh, keeping the child away from the other parent. <clears throat> so, so this the question though that Janelle Burrill was asking is, is there a connection? Is it possible to show that these alienating behaviors were causing the behavioral symptoms of uh, parental alienation in the children? And this is what she concluded. The answer was yes. And she did it statistically. In other words, the more negative, she, the, the more severe the symptoms in the parent, in the alienating parent, the more severe they were, the more negative the behaviors of the child. In other words, the, the parents who were severe level of alienating behaviors were more likely to have children who were more severely alienated from the other parent. So that all makes sense. In other words, that's all what we would expect, but this helps to prove that there is a connection between the alienating behaviors and the result in the children. And her conclusion was, uh, this study appears to support the existence of PAS, which I would agree that it did. Of course, that was 20 years ago. And you can imagine, you know, we've built on that since then. So we're talking here about uh, quantitative research that supports the reality of parental alienation that, that can be used as part of proving that it passes the Dalbert test. So here's a, here's a study that I did with my colleagues. And uh, 
it's based on the idea that you read this quote here, it's based on the answer to this idea that severely alienated children engage in a high level of splitting, which means they preserve, they perceive the preferred parent in extremely positive terms and the rejected parent in extremely negative terms. So you might know that splitting is a well-known concept that occurs in psychology. And splitting means that one person is totally good and another person is totally bad. Or some people engage in splitting with the same person. They'll say, uh, um, I hate my sister. My sister is the most evil person in the world. And two days later, the same person is saying, I love my sister. She's the most wonderful person in the world. So some people engage in splitting of the same person, but what happens in alienated children, they engage in splitting, saying that one parent is bad and one parent is wonderful. So is it possible, what we were asking in this research is, is it possible to measure this objectively with numbers? <clears throat> So we had to define things. Uh, this is the definition of alienation, rejection of a parent without a good reason. But it's different from what happens in neglect or in, in children who are simply abused, that those children are ambivalent. Now, this is a really an interesting distinction that this has been known clinically for many years. Many people have said this, that children who are abused don't totally reject that parent. They usually, they want to go back to that parent, except they just wish that that daddy would shape up or that mommy would not lose her temper so much. So it is interesting, and that, that's what we call counterintuitive, which is that children who are abused still want to go back to that parent, while children who are alienated, who were never abused, say they never want to see that parent again. So that's hard to understand, but that's exactly what happens in cases of parental alienation. So in this study, we had several groups. Read off the top, it says intact families, divorced families, families where the children were neglected, meaning one of the parents, and it turned out that was the dad, abandoned the family in these cases. And then we had children who were alienated from their dad and children who were alienated from their mother. And we gave all of these children a very simple questionnaire, which takes about 20 minutes. It's easy to do, it's easy to read. Uh, you can do it with children, older children and teenagers. And these are, I'm, I just have some examples here of what's on this questionnaire. For instance, question number one says about my father, my father says nice things about me. And then the child answers, true, not true, never true, or whatever. That's, that's something positive. And then there are also negative uh, things. For instance, uh, my father pays no attention to me. And the child answers that. So you can do this. There's a series of questions about dad, a series of questions about mom, and you can capture the child's opinion about mom and about dad. And you, you, you don't do it, uh, these two questionnaires back to back. You, you, you do one and then you, then you intersperse some other test or activity and then you do the other one. And this all has been standardized. This is now done on almost always, it's done online. So it's, it's the, the data that's kind of collected by a computer and scored by a computer. <laughs> So that makes it even more objective. This is obviously an objective test. The, the, the child simply indicates an answer and then you add up the answers. So um, I'm gonna tell you the results of this, <clears throat> but uh, you just have to know what it says here at the bottom, that if the score is low, that's a very positive feeling about that parent. For instance, if the child the, the lowest possible score is 60. And if a child has that score regarding mother, then the, the child has an extremely positive opinion of mother. That kids hardly ever get it, the totally lowest score or the totally highest score. Although a few kids who are alienated did exactly that. <clears throat> if the score on what I'm gonna show you is very, very high, they, the child has a very negative view. 
So let's take a look at the results. Here they are. So if you start at the left on an intact family, the, the child has almost the same opinion of mom and dad. Well, that's good, you know, and it's a positive opinion. The score, it looks like it was about 90. And so that's close to the, the positive end of the scale. In a divorced family, the child has almost the same opinion about mom and dad. Here, I can sort of point this out here by doing this. So in, in divorced families, the opinion is a little bit more negative. It's still in the positive range. It's a little bit more negative, but it's, it's almost the same between mom and dad. In the neglected family, our families where the dad has, uh, this is the dad up here, where the dad has abandoned the family. So he's getting a more negative score and the mom is getting a more positive score. So that makes sense. <clears throat> If the dad is an alienated dad, his scores were extremely negative. This is almost at the top possible range. Now, this is an this is uh, this is twenty some kids here, and this is their average score, who were all alienated from their dads. Their opinions of mom was extremely positive, and then we had about twenty some children who were alienated from their mother. And it was the reverse. Their opinion about their mother was extremely negative. So see this gap? I mean, see, see how different this is from the, between the dad and the mom? The, normal children do not have these extreme opinions, which is what you call splitting. And we don't think that abused children will either. We, we're, we need to study abused children and see what their opinions are of mom and dad. I, I, I need to throw in something here. I realize that there may be children who were extremely abused, who do have extremely negative opinions about that parent or even maybe both parents. So I'm not, I realize that can happen and that they would be interesting to study those children. But in a typical uh, family getting divorced, that's not the kind of abuse they're talking about. They're talking about uh, sort of more mild or maybe moderate levels of abuse or this like what we call here neglecting. And in those children are, are almost certainly still gonna have ambivalent feelings towards both parents. So we took, we took this one more step, which is we measured the differences and we call this the gap. <clears throat> and as you can see, the gap in alienated children is very, very high. And so what does that look like? Well, we wrote a whole other paper about the gap. And this is what it looked like. In other words, over here in the red, are the children who are alienated and their gap score is above 100. And some, some are very, very high. In some of these children, they gave the highest possible score to one parent and the lowest possible score to the other parent. So they have very high gap scores. There's one girl here, if you look at this red spot, who we considered alienated, but who did not have a very high gap score. But most of them, if you use the cutoff of 90, which would be right here, if you use that cutoff, that this little test, the PARQ, Parental Alienation, uh, Parental Acceptance Rejection Questionnaire, was 99% accurate in distinguishing the alienated children from the non-alienating children. So that's an extremely high rate of accuracy for any psychological test. So I've talked about different types of research. Let me uh, have one more type of research, which is interventions. So what's, what's your guess? What's the success rate of interventions for parental alienation? And there are several interventions that are used, and we're really talking here about severe alienation, where the kids have not seen the other parent for months or even a year or so. What's the su success rate of those interventions? You wanna guess in your mind, it's very high. This is an article by Richard Warshak, and he's talking about the outcome study of uh, children who went through family bridges. And in that study, uh, it, it was 95% successful by the end of the uh, program, which only lasts four days. You know, in family bridges, the child 
goes to the program with the parent they had previously rejected. They have no contact at all with the alienating parent for a period of time. And after four days, they, they, were, they were comfortable with their rejected parent and they went home with that person and they lived with that person successfully. <clears throat> now, some of these children do relapse, so it doesn't stick at 95% successful. But the ones who relapse generally are, are have a premature re, reunited with the alienating parent. If something happens, they're not supposed to, but they see that parent, they get indoctrinated all over again. So this, this um, intervention is very, very good, but it's not perfect because in some cases it can be undone. Uh, this is a similar intervention in Canada called Family Reflections uh, by a psychologist named Kathleen Ray. And she also had a very similar success after a four day intervention. So there is some promise here that um, there are ways to intervene and to help these children. Now, these are, these are children who were severely alienated. So you can imagine it should be easier and I think it is easier to intervene with children who are mildly alienated or children who are only maybe at some risk of being alienated. In fact, that's, that's where we should be headed. We should be trying to catch these cases when the cases are mild before they become horrible or even find uh, ways to uh, prevent alienation from starting in the first place. So I've been talking about um, in this, the, the, this area, uh, studies of um, research that are quantitative, in other words, studies that you can actually uh, see numbers proving something one way or the other. So I only told you about three or four studies, but there are reviews of these studies, and here are three of them. Uh, Michael Saney did one, which was a book chapter. Amy Baker did one, which was a book chapter. Uh, these people named Marquez, which was a group of psychologists from Spain, uh, did one, which was an article in a journal. And just let me give you an example of what they say. The Michael Saney book chapter had this very important conclusion. There's a remarkable agreement about the behavioral strategies parents can use to potentially manipulate their children's feelings, attitudes, and beliefs that interfere with the relationship with the other parent. Well, what, what, what is he talking about here? He's talking here about what we call alienating behaviors. And he said, and, and after reviewing these studies, 58 studies, he said there's a remarkable agreement about these strategies about alienating behaviors that can be used. And then the second thing he says, the cluster of symptoms or behavioral indicators, behaviors indicating the presence of alienation in the child can also be reliably identified. Well, what's he talking about there? He's talking about the eight, <clears throat> the eight um, common symptoms of parental alienation that were originally described by Gardner. In other words, he's saying that the, the 17 18 alienating behaviors, the eight symptoms of alienation can be reliably identified. And that's very important. Um, to, for a, a person who studied this and, ex, and extensively to be able to say that. Now, that doesn't mean everything about parental alienation is solved, but that the most basic facts, um, there's an agreement on. This is what Amy Baker said in her chapter where she reviewed these. The purpose of this chapter is to provide legal and mental health professionals with enough information for them to be able to explain and defend the scientific merits of the key concept of PA theory. So she's actually addressing the Daubert criteria. Uh, she doesn't use the word Daubert in this sentence, but that's what she did in this book chapter from our book called Parental Alienation Science and Law, <clears throat> in which she summarizes uh, 22 research studies and that they can be used if, if you're in court and you're trying to prove that parental alienation theory passes Daubert, you can go to her chapter and look at these 22 studies and present them. Uh, if you're the expert, you can present them, or if you're the attorney, you can coordinate with the expert into how to present these research studies. 
So this is what I've tried to do so far. I've tried to prove to you that uh, alienation is accepted in the scientific community. I had 10 or so in national organizations to illustrate that. I tried to review to show that it's in peer reviewed and publicated uh, publications. And there are hundreds of these publications, but I'm not able to tell you all of them right now. Um, and that it's been tested through a scientific methodology. So I think that this passes the Dalbert criteria and that if you ever are, are confronted with this uh, in court, you should be able to get past that hurdle. <clears throat> so I've been talking about a lot of uh, scientific research and stuff uh, that's been published. So this is a, a little uh, note about fertilization as a parent in the pop in popular culture. Though, so do, uh, do everyday people, do they understand what this is about? And almost everybody, if you're at a party or something and you say you study parental alienation, the person almost always says, oh yes, I didn't know the name of it, but that happened to my cousin. Anyway, this is a cartoon from the New Yorker magazine. And these two guys are sitting at a bar and this guy here with the martini who has some scratches on his head, he's saying, since we don't have any children, my ex turned the cats against me. So I think that's a, that's a good illustration of how the concept is widely understood. So I, I've gone through um, these criteria for the Dauber um, test, the gatekeeping function of Dauber. And I've, I've given you three different ways that you can prove that it meets general um, acceptance, that it's been published in peer reviewed journals, and that it's been studied scientifically. So I wanna address briefly the fact that it actually has been presented in court a lot and has been accepted in court a lot. So that's what we wanna show you here in this next part. Here are some legal precedents involving parental alienation. So here's the question. How many times, think in your own mind, how many times do you think it's that parental alienation has been accepted in family courts in the United States? You know, just guess a number. So, um, this is an article published about a year ago in Family Court Review, and the author of this was our colleague, Demosthenes Lorandos. And he uh, collected all of the cases in a 33-year period, 34-year period, in which parental alienation was accepted, meaning that the, the court allowed for the topic to be discussed, or the court itself introduced the topic. In other words, we're not simply talking about cases in which one of the mom or the dad raised the topic, but we're talking about cases in which the court uh, accepted the topic as a legitimate topic for, for the case to be considered. And it also doesn't mean that the court always found that parental alienation was present, simply that the topic was admissible, or as Dr. Miranda said, the concept, the concept of parental alienation was material, probative, relevant, and admissible. So in those years, we found, or he found, that it was accepted uh, more than 1,100 times in courts. Most of these are appellate courts. Some of them were trial courts. But as you can imagine, if there's this many written records in appellate courts and trial courts, you can imagine that there are many more times when it, it was in court, but we don't really have a record of it. <clears throat> so this is, the, this is the graph, which is fascinating because it shows that uh, the frequency with which parental alienation was accepted in court has gradually increased since 1985 when Richard Gardner first described it. And on, in one year, it was more than 100 cases. So obviously there's a trend of greater acceptance of these cases in the United States courts and also in other places like in Canada, same, the same trend. 
So here's another question. Who is it who does the alienating? Is it the mom, the dad, or somebody else? And the answer to that is, at least in the cases that Dr. Orando's had, most of the alienating parents were the mothers. Some were the dads, some were other people, other means, maybe a grandparent, or it simply wasn't known. In other words, uh, the document didn't explain who was doing the alienating. I think we can skip these two cases here that I was going to tell you about that happened in Tennessee, because I want to tell you, I want to tell you something here about the five-factor model. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, Dr. Baker and I uh, put together this idea that all that uh, of how to, in a given case, how do we make the diagnosis of parental alienation? And I'm going to tell you about these five factors. And um, just to point out that none of this is new. In other words, uh, I'm going to go through the factors right now, but you'll see that this is all based on studies that have been done all along for the last 35 years. But pulling them together and calling it the five factor model helps clinicians evaluate these families because you go through is one, two, three, you know, is each one present? And it also helps in court explain how we arrive at these um, at these conclusions. So um, here's here are the five factors. The child manifests contact refusal. There's a prior positive relationship with that parent. In other words, factor one is part of the definition of alienation, the child refuses to see the other parent. Factor two is in the past, they had a good relationship. Factor three is it's not caused by abuse. Factor four is uh, what I've already talked about, the alienating behaviors by the preferred parent. And factor five are the symptoms in the child. And I'm gonna show you a little video here. And I think that we'll probably finish up uh, this video lasts about two minutes, two, two or three minutes, and I think we'll finish up right after this video. So take a look at this. Um, we have this on the website of the Parental Nation Study Group and uh, this and a number of other little videos, but take a look at this and see what you think about it. When a child rejects a parent, you need to know, has the child been manipulated by the other parent to unjustifiably reject the targeted parent rather than reasonably reacting to abuse? You can't just tell by a child's statement. Dr. Amy Baker gives us the five-factor model to help accurately diagnose parental alienation. All five things need to be present so there's no mistake because the treatment for alienation and abuse is the opposite approach. In treatment, the abused child receives support and affirmation for the child's realistic negative perceptions of the abusive parent, and the abusive parent atones for what they've done and modifies their parenting behavior. In contrast, the alienated child has been brainwashed and pressured by the favored parent into unreasonable negative perceptions that are distortions from reality. In treatment, the alienated child's illusions are challenged to help the child see the parent as safe, loving, and available. Factor one, the child manifests contact resistance or refusal. That is, avoids a relationship with one of the parents. Factor two, there was a prior positive relationship between the child and the now rejected parent. That means that whatever flaws the targeted parent has, it didn't prevent a close, loving attachment bond to the child who's now rejecting them. Factor three, there's the absence of abuse or neglect. You need accurate ways of determining if a parent has been abusive and don't want to misidentify any abusive parent as an alienated parent. Factor four, the favored parent has engaged in many of the 17 primary parental alienation strategies that foster the child's unjustified rejection of the other parent. This is the subject of another video. Factor five, the child behaves like an alienated child. 
there are eight behavioral manifestations of parental alienation that differentiate alienated kids from non-alienated kids. Abused children and alienated children don't treat their parents the same way. For information about the eight manifestations of parental alienation, watch the video, Differentiating Alienated Children from Abused Children. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that little video. There are more of those on the website of Parental Alienation Study Group. So um, I, I've, uh, I've covered a lot of territory here. And we're going to have time for discussion and questions. Um, there's, uh, th this is simply the same five factor model going through the factors in a little bit greater detail. Um, and the research that's, that is the basis for factor four, which was the 17 alienating behaviors. So this is the research that supports that. And then there are the uh, eight manifestations in the child. And then this is the research that supports that. So if you ever go to court with this, it's, it's fairly easy to collect the relevant research and to explain it. Well, there is one more thing that I, I'm not going to discuss in any detail, but you, you need to be aware of it. That I, I've gotten really interested in all of the misinformation that's published regarding this topic. And it is very discouraging because we frequently see uh, journal articles, book chapters, presentations by people who say things about parental alienation that are simply incorrect or untrue. So if, if you go into this field, you have to be alert for this, that in court, if, 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 an, uh, if an expert is testifying for the other side, you have to be alert that, that the things that he or she is saying may be totally bogus. And um, you, you have to try to, if possible, to challenge the thing, basically they, the, the most common thing is to misrepresent parental alienation theory, to make parental alienation theory look stupid. And uh, so that's something they try to get away with, but it, it's false because they're simply making it up. And I'm just saying that this is an interesting aspect of this field is the amount of misinformation. So we're not gonna actually go through these today. Um, but there, it's, it's very interesting to try to locate fake information about this topic. This happens to be a journal where a lot of this information comes from. It's called the Journal of Child Custody. And this is something that they say, that the publisher says. Look at this real quick. The publisher uh, makes no representations or warranties whatsoever. Any opinions and views are the opinions and views of the authors and are not the views or endorsed by Taylor and Francis. And then it says this wonderful sentence, the accuracy of the content should not be relied upon. Well, that's true that that journal has repeatedly published things that are incorrect. And, and you, you have to uh, look for other sources of information. So um, this is um, the book that we published last year and we talk a lot about misinformation in the book. In other words, most chapters present our perspective and our explanation of, of uh, some aspect of parental alienation. And then the last part of the chapter discusses false information that has been said uh, and, and how to deal with it and how to refute it. And then here's another book that's real, real good that just came out about a month or so ago by Ashish Joshi which is called Litigating for Alienation. This book is published by the American Bar Association, which gives it some credibility. And it has a whole chapter on misinformation. So if you're interested in this topic, uh, especially the misinformation, there's, pl there's plenty of ways to, to, uh, to learn about that. So I've enjoyed uh, seeing you today, so to speak. And I know we're gonna have uh, some question answer uh, time right now. Uh, think about this. If, if you're interested in this topic and you want to learn more, uh, consider joining our organization called the Parental Alienation Study Group. It's easy to find uh, through Google. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I think we're going to have a little uh, question answer period right now. <laughs>